Hello everyone, this is Chandan Sharma from QNP Tech, anchoring today's webinar and supporting the event logistically. So on behalf of QNP Tech, I would first like to thank and welcome you all to this web event on Test Automation Trends 2017 and beyond. So we've come a long way in test automation. Talking about Selenium and similar open source libraries have widened our planes of thought and innovation. But to an extent, Selenium has even spoiled us too. I feel it's difficult to think beyond Selenium for test automation. And we have started taking Selenium as a silver bullet. I remember in my early days of test automation, I read it somewhere that there is no silver bullet for test automation. Each problem has to be tackled and solved in its unique way. But with the global acceptance of phenomenon of Selenium, the same viewpoint of thoughts with Selenium widened. It at the end made it narrower for creativity, efficiency, and effective answers for problem solving. So today, our aim out here is to share with you where we are, how far can we come along, and where do we really want to go from here. Also, where is the industry headed as such, and how to do justice to our existence in emerging arena of DevOps, as their QE models, and aggressive agile practices. So please, let's join Ramandeep, Director, Test Automation Research Lab at QN for Tech, to discuss about the trends in test automation in 2017 and the years to come and beyond. Also, please feel free to send your questions to us anytime during the web event using the questions tab on GoToWebinar platform. At the end of the session, we will try to answer all the questions received during this web event. All participants are on mute at this time to allow the speaker to present. Over to Ramandeep now. All right. Thank you, Chandan, and once again, uh, very warm welcome to all of you to end this webinar presentation. Uh, so before we dive into the main content, let's have a quick look at the agenda for today. Uh, we, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, briefly about the history of the test automation at, at the, as we have seen it in the industry and at QN for Tech how the test automation has evolved, what kind of practices were being followed, what is the current day situation of test automation in terms of technology, practices, solutions. And then we'll also look at um, uh, what are the current, uh, the present times expectations from test automation and what are the challenges in, a work, uh, in fulfilling these uh, expectations. Then we'll look at some of the solutions and resolutions to some of these challenges as we have devised them at QN Protect and also in the rest of the industry, how things are being done when it comes to test automation. Followed by that, I'll end the presentation by talking about the emerging trends in test automation and where the overall industry of test automation and quality engineering is heading towards. Martin Fowler. Uh, a very renowned uh, CI and CD evangelist once said, imperfect tests run frequently are much better than perfect tests that are never written at all. So he was talking about development practice, continuous integration, but the emphasis entirely was on tests and how to write them and how to make sure that the tests are effective and they contribute to overall development of the application. That really shows the importance of uh, automated tests in present day world, where we're dealing with a lot of continuous delivery, continuous deployment and integration practices, and aggressive agile practices. But let's look at uh, our journey into test automation so far, where we are and how have we reached to this spot till date. At the very early days of um, uh, testing and test automation, one would remember that black box test automation was all that we were doing. That means that uh, we used to heavily rely on the application's UI to uh, create and run automated tests. Because that's exactly what most of the testers, the manual testers, the functional testers at that point of time were doing. They were waiting for the application's UI and an interface to be available to them. And then they used to use the application UI to exercise the complete system from that interface and validate and verify the requirements and the completeness of the application. And the test automation solutions at that time were essentially doing exactly that. They were trying to simulate and replace the manual tester by putting in a robot created out of either a code or through some set of tools. And one would also remember 
the kind of this automation tools that are available back then. I'm talking about almost like 12, 13 years ago uh, when we had uh, uh, a series of uh, commercial tools and some of the most popular ones were WinRunner, Silktest, QuickTest Pro, uh, QTP and a bunch of others. Now at that point of time, uh, since most reliance was on building new uh, tests around applications UI, we had to heavily rely on commercial test automation tools. Uh, but at that point of time, we also saw emergence of some of the open source libraries and players in this market of test automation. Uh, we saw Selenium came into picture and it changed the game a little bit. How did it change the game? Well, it gave us uh, test automation engineers a new plane to start thinking and be more creative in terms of implementing the automated solution. We were earlier relying on commercial off-the-shelf tools, but now we have this library in our hands which we can mold and uh, which we can use to build our own test solution out of. And hence, this gave birth to test frameworks. We were building, uh, and the early frameworks that we built were nothing but keyword-driven test framework uh, where you would have multiple columns of data entry. Uh, first column being an action that has to be performed on the application UI, and the remaining column being the object on which the action has to be performed and the data that has to be entered supporting that action. Uh, robot framework uh, is actually a very interesting and a great implementation of keyword driven uh, test framework which is available uh, out there already. Now during this time we also started doing, uh, uh, started exploring more of uh, testing from uh, the way it was being done in development, that is unit testing. We try to build framework around the existing support that is available for testing in, uh, in unit tests uh, world, which is using uh, test in DOJ unit, which are the unit testing libraries in uh, Java. Then from that point, uh, when we uh, started learning more about development practices, we got influence from the uh, the way development was using MVC and various different frameworks and convention over configuration uh, style of uh, methodology of implementing the products and implementing the code and taking the influences from those ideas and concepts we started doing some of the experiments in our own test automation solution and we come up with something that we now refer to as a domain specific language driven framework. Now, what is a DSL framework? Unlike a keyword-driven framework where uh, a keyword is a representation of a user action and interaction that the user would perform on the UI, in domain-specific language, the keyword or the key, uh, uh, key phrase is a representation of a task or an activity that an end user would perform on the application's front end or an interface. For instance, uh, if I look, if I take a look at any e-commerce application like Amazon, uh, then um, some of the popular domain-specific actions or, uh, or keywords could be to perform a search for a product, select a product, and add it into sh into shopping cart from the shopping grid. Um, check out the product using credit card. Uh, login into the application. So these are some of the uh, higher level domain specific tasks and activities that one would perform on an application UI. And these higher level tasks are actually composed of lower level interactions in the uh, in um, in terms of uh, the user interactions with the application. Now uh, with these development practices and influences from uh, frameworks like Spring, Start, and MVC architecture, we started implementing <coughs> uh, domain-specific language-based framework. And it gave us great value in test automation. Uh, it gave us more amount of maintainability and it reduced the overall effort of maintaining uh, as well as implementing new tests 
uh, using this framework. So it was actually an advancement from the earlier versions of the framework that we had. And on top of that, it actually gave us some level of fluency in the way we describe our automated tests. If you look at the keyword-driven um, uh, framework, the level and the verbosity at which we used to describe the automated tests, they were highly technical in nature. We're using languages like click on button X, enter text in uh, text box Y, uh, enter text in text box Z, click on button Y, click on link. So they were highly lower level uh, technical language which was talking in terms of interaction. But if a functional tester or a business person would try to make a sense out of it, it'll be really difficult for that person to understand that test. But in terms of when we started describing tests in the DSL framework in a fluent uh, uh, vocabulary, it was easier for business per person uh, uh, or a functional tester, a subject matter expert, to understand what is going on in the automated script because the, because the fluency of uh, the description of the test was much higher and it, it, it almost matched the domain language of uh, the application. At about the same time, we saw emergence of uh, practices like test-driven development and behavior-driven development. And then North came with the idea of Cucumber and which instantly became popular and uh, slowly but surely a lot of uh, uh, development, it, it started drilling into a lot of development practices and people started consuming that a lot. And when we looked at Cucumber, we found it an instant fit for our domain-specific language-based frameworks where we found that it was really easy to write comprehensible and fluent automated tests which anybody can look at and understand and make sense out of. And we can then implement that in Java or any other language using our domain-specific language framework on top of it. Uh, and then the next stage was a natural uh, uh, stage of uh, adding more maturity into the framework. What we now have was uh, uh, a framework which is capable of not just automating web applications or desktop-based applications or mobile applications, essentially the UI-based applications, but also a framework which was able to also automate uh, APIs, whether they are RESTful, RPC, XML, uh, XML RPC, JSON RPC, JAX RPC, or uh, SOAP-based uh, web services, and also database interactions. So we had uh, implemented a mature framework which was able to automate all different aspects of the application. Although in the early stages we were just using uh, uh, the other kinds of automation for just generating test data and not actually doing test validation because most of the validation was still being done at the application's front end in a black box fashion. But, uh, and uh, alongside uh, being able to uh, automate API and uh, database, we added the capability of continuous integration. CI was adopted in, into development practice and it was imperative that we also make sure that the test automation solutions are, uh, can actually be hooked into an existing continuous integration pipeline so that the sanity of the build can be tested before, or sanity of the check-in can be tested before uh, it goes into an actual build which gets deployed and made available to uh, the next line of users which are testers for further testing of an application. So essentially build verification. So we made sure that the framework had uh, continuous integration capability in it. Uh, so where do we, uh, where, 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 do we uh, where are we today in terms of test, our test automation practice and where is the industry uh, right now uh, in terms of test automation? Well, we have really mature and sophisticated test automation frameworks. Um, if you look at the application nowadays, most of the applications are not two or three tier, they are multi-tiered applications. You have applications which have multiple variations in terms of an interface available as a web app which can be accessed through browsers. 
an interface available as mobile apps, which can be accessed as native applications inside Android, iOS, or Windows Phone mobile devices, uh, or an possible integration with other third-party third applications through APIs, where I can use application A to access and interact and uh, exercise the business rules that are actually written in application B because these two applications are joined together or interlinked or interacting together through an API interface that was built between these two applications. So uh, the applications have different variations, but the business rules and the test cases essentially remain the same uh, around these applications. So at this point, we have a need of a framework which is generic and comprehensive enough so that the single framework can be used to automate all these different variations of the application, whether it's the different kinds of UI, web, mobile, desktop, or the different kind of interfaces, UI or API. So we actually have these kind of frameworks nowadays. Uh, in fact, let me also show you a demo of one such uh, framework. Um, now this, the demo that I'm showing you is actually a framework which is written in Ruby, but uh, we have uh, a framework built on same philosophy and same capacity and capability in all other programming languages as well, be it Java, Python, C Sharp, uh, and uh, JavaScript. So let me um, run the UI test first. So I have these UI tests written in, uh, uh, for a web application. This is for an application which is a web interface as well as an API interface. So I'm going to build the test and I'm going to go into uh, a view where I have opened um, remotely connected to a virtual machine which is running somewhere. Uh, where you just saw a browser coming up and uh, the application was logged in and a bunch of actions were performed in the application. So essentially the UI tests are being uh, exercised against the UI, web UI of an application. Uh, so it's testing the login form, then it's doing a bunch of other things as well. Uh, I think that is the end of it. Let me go back. And this interface that you're seeing in front of you is actually Jenkins, which is a very popular continuous integration server, which enables uh, CI uh, practices uh, through a web interface. So the tests were executed, and this is the test, as you see, which was executed. There were two different tests, uh, which had various different validations. And I'm, in this particular case, I'm using RSpec. Uh, which is again somewhat similar to uh, Cucumber in terms of describing the test in a behavior-driven fashion. Um, okay, so all the tests were passed. There are no test failures. Now, the same framework and the same test can also be executed using an API interface of this, this site. So let me actually run the test. This time you would not see any browser coming up because it's actually running the RESTful API test against this application. And in order to do that, uh, it is calling the RESTful interface in the language and then performing various validations on top of it, like um, uh, displaying a list of accounts that are already there and then uh, checking um, that the particular account ID exists and then for invalid account ID I'm getting an, an uh, uh, failure HTTP status. In this particular case, you can see the test has failed, and the reason is because in case of a failure, I was expecting 500 HTTP response code, but rather the API gave me back 200 response code, which is unlikely. There's a bug in the APIs. Uh, so this is how the same framework essentially can be used uh, uh, to perform tests for both UI and API, and internally they could be different tests, they could be the same set of tests that can be executed over different interfaces. Now, besides having these sophisticated frameworks, we didn't stop there. We went ahead and started adding more capability and capacity into the framework uh, so that all those things that otherwise were not being validated and tested in automated tests can now also be tested. 
for instance layout testing that is one area where normally your ui driven automated tests do not linger into uh, now what are layout tests well imagine um, um, an application which is a responsive application which is built for um, uh, three different form factors a full desktop view a tablet view and a a mobile device view, a smaller form factor, a medium form factor, and a larger form factor. Now, um, if you have this application and you really want to make sure that the application would not just function properly in these three form factors, it would also look appropriately and in terms of appearance, the, the buttons and everything, all the layout and uh, the application UI would appear properly in these three interfaces uh, and form factors as well. You need to actually do some level of visual verifications of uh, uh, the UI. But with Selenium in picture, or for that matter, any other automated test, uh, testing tool which is doing uh, context driven test automation, the tools are essentially are relying on the structure of the application rather than the UI to figure out where the components are and then interact with them. So uh, the tools are good. These tools and framework that depend on them, uh, written on them, are good for doing functional validation. But when it comes to layout validation, which is taking the appearance, these tools do not provide appropriate support. So what we did was we added additional libraries into the framework to add the whole capability of doing layout testing alongside doing functional testing. So now what we have is one framework in which I can run a functional test and while the functional test is being performed, uh, I can also trigger some um, uh, UI layout test which then can be performed on the UI which is displayed in the device and then uh, the validation on the UI can also be done. Let me show you uh, some of the reports from these uh, UI tests. Uh, uh, we did this test for one of the e-commerce applications and this is the kind of report that is generated. Now the execution was for a functional test and while the functional test was being done, the layout validations were also done. Uh, the layout validations could be like if a particular uh, container uh, or an element has the right kind of fonts, right size of fonts or not, or, and you can see that these screenshots are actually annotated. Or uh, if, let's say, a particular element is available in the right place in the UI, the expected place in the UI or not. So all such things uh, can actually be tested. For instance, in this particular case, this uh, element should, di should be displayed by default in the full desktop view. And in a mobile view, this element should be hidden. It should actually be available in a collapsed menu. Uh, so that is what we are testing, that in a full desktop view, the element is visible. Uh, so all such things, be it related to compatibility of the uh, application in different environments, or be it related to responsive designing, that can be tested using layout testing. And by adding this capability, we added this uh, we made the uh, uh, automation framework more effective in terms of uh, providing better and enhanced coverage. Now, similarly, we added more capabilities to the uh, test automation framework by adding capabilities to perform accessibility tests and security tests as well while the functional tests are being performed. Now, if you'd like to know more about these two, I'll recommend you to uh, go ahead and search the InfoTech's website for all the webinars that we have done. We have done a series of all the webinars uh, specific to all these points with the layout testing, accessibility testing, and security testing, and how to do them using our test automation frameworks using Selenium and other tools. Now, this is where we are. Uh, but what are the challenges that we are still facing today uh, and uh, what kind of problems are we still, uh, do we still have to tackle? Well, we are in a stage of hyper-agile. Practices like DevOps and, and uh, similar aggressive agile practices are being rapidly adopted and followed by uh, organizations so that uh, the application that they're developing can be released to the market as early as possible as a feedback, a chain of feedback can give us enough time to improve the quality 
of the application and deliverable to the end user as early as possible. But then these practices have shortened the time frame in which we have to act as quality engineers. Uh, the need of the R is faster sprints and shorter cycles. That means we have less amount of time to test as well as to implement automated tests for all the new features that are, that are coming up. And also on the side, maintain and run the regression test suites to check any regression impact on the existing features of the application because of the newer changes and bug fixes that were added. So the need of the R is actually to be able to do test automation in, in sprint fashion, in sync with the development. That means if there's a sprint A, and sprint A has 10 features that have to be implemented in the sprint, all the, those 10 features, all the tests that have to, uh, that are required to uh, validate and accept these uh, 10 features have to be implemented. The automated tests have to be implemented in the same sprint so that the tests can be used for acceptance of the stories and the features as well as the tests can be used for any regression test and uh, in any testing that, has, that would be performed after the sprint. Uh, but we have limited, limited amount of time of doing that because of the aggressive agile practices, the sprint cycles, and the release time has shortened a lot. And on top of that, we have a series and huge list of regression test suites. And because most of these test suites were written at uh, the black box level, at the application view at the front end level, they are flaky in nature for various different reasons. And uh, they're not reliable. They, they are they instable in nature. Uh, and then we tackle on a daily basis, we have to uh, work around these uh, 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 tests which are giving us uh, false failures and then we have to uh, work around them to make sure that uh, the releases are done properly. So what are we doing to tackle and handle these challenges? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, the need of the R is to enhance the overall velocity at which we implement and not, uh, automate uh, the tests for an application. Uh, and the first and foremost thing that we emphasize a lot on is to be able to write fluent test descriptions for any test. Now, if you remember the older days where we were using JUnit or TestNG for describing our automated tests, it was difficult for anybody else to, to comprehend and understand these tests because they essentially were a piece of code to the rest of the world. And uh, it was difficult to figure out the effectiveness of these tests because the tests were incepted, designed, and implemented solely by the test automation engineers who at times might not be a subject matter expert or a functional expert uh, in the application or to be an expert in the application. So they might be that small amount of gap into what is the actual test objective and what is the actual test that has been implemented. And there was no way for anybody to validate that because um, all the other people who were supposed to uh, help us in building those tests, they cannot understand our tests because they're written in languages using tools like JUnit and testing. Now, in order to bridge this communication gap and make sure that everybody is able to contribute into tests which are automated, and then we're always automating those tests which would give us maximum value, essentially making the overall test automation process more effective, we had to bring in practices which enables us to write tests in a fluent language. And hence, we adopted use of uh, uh, technologies or tools and frameworks like Ocumber, GWT, like Fitness, uh, RSpec, uh, Mocha, depending on which language you're building, the automated test suite and solutions are, that implementation of Gherkin we would be using. So uh, these tests, they, they essentially helped us. Uh, when we started writing tests in the fluent uh, language, fluent test description, they helped, in, uh, helped us in two ways. First is they made sure that the tests are more effective. 
and uh, we are automating the we are investing our time into right kind of tests and which would give us more value for test automation and on top of that uh, since we have decoupled all the technical language in the description of the test at the time of implementation as a test implementer as an automation engineer i am free to decide where or how in the application i'm going to implement this test as in would i use this test to implement uh, uh, the test objective using the ui of the application or would i use this test to implement uh, the test objective and fulfill the test objective using the api of the application uh, so because we are writing the test by decoupling all the te technical information uh, as an implementer i am free to decide at the time of implementation that what is the most effective implementation the what is the most cost effective implementation of this test would be so i now have that flexibility of figuring out whether this would be an api test or a ui test or a combination of both api and a ui test <clears throat> The next thing that uh, we uh, did was we made sure that all our test frameworks provide a direct integration to test management systems. Now, uh, in the earlier days, we were writing a lot of automated regression tests. They were running out of our CI systems, but they, and the results were available in form of emailable reports, back into the CI as part of failed reports, but the tests uh, results were not getting uh, traced back to the actual requirements and the actual uh, uh, code changes that were being done. Since all of those things were being done using uh, Jira and other project management tools, we decided that we must build an integration of the automated test tool, automated test solution, so that the results go back into the same tool, where same solution or system where all the other artifacts of the project are available, so that a proper traceability between the results and the requirements can be established. Uh, let me actually show you a video which uh, shows how we built one possible such implementation. Now this is a Jira interface, and you can see it's an agile board, and we have a bunch of uh, user stories around, and two of these user stories are in ready for QA state. Now if I go in and run the, and these user stories would also have acceptance tests associated with them in Jira. In this particular case, we're using TestRail as our test management tool, and TestRail is actually available as a plugin which gets integrated with Jira. So we've written the test cases, the acceptance tests for the stories in TestRail, and um, the stories are available in Jira on our uh, rapid board and agile board. If I go in and run the automated test, uh, just trigger uh, the the test. I don't at this point I do not provide what test to execute, but what the test solution would do is it's going to query Jira for my project and find out all the user stories that are in two tests or ready to ready for QA status. Then it's going to uh, pull out all the tests that are linked to these uh, user stories that are in two tests or uh, ready for QA state. Execute only those tests. Uh, prepare the results for those tests. That's exactly what is happening. These are tests for MDB applications. So the browser was launched. They are UI tests. And and is going to uh, execute those tests. And then once the results are available, it's going to push the results back to Jira alongside those tests so that the results are available in the same system in which we are tracking the test cases as well as the requirements. And then it is going to do a triage of the user stories based on the results. If all the acceptance tests for one story has passed, it's going to move the story to the next possible swim lane depending on the workflow in Jira that we have designed for the project. And if the uh, test has failed, it's going to move the uh, story back to the previous uh, swim lane. That's exactly what has happened. One of the story has automatically moved to done state because the framework has done it using the API. And the other story for which one of the tests has failed, which is this, you see there's one failure in there. This particular test uh, story, because the acceptance test has failed, it's just moved back to to-do state. 
So the developers can be notified that you made a change in this story, but the acceptance is still not uh, passed. We need to work more on it. <coughs> so what is happening is that with this kind of an integration build, we have now an end-to-end -end traceability with the code uh, that and the changes that developers are making in the product code in the application code. The test cases that are linked to the actual requirements and user stories and the results of those test cases. All of that is available in a single spot and a complete end-to-end -end traceability can be maintained, which essentially enhances the overall um, uh, effectiveness of test automation solution and the value can be seen right in front of us. The next an obvious thing that we did uh, in the test automation practice, which everybody is following, and we have been talking about this since a very long time, is to make a shift towards the left side in the development timeline. So what is shift left? Shift left is to be able to test uh, the piece of code as early as possible. If, uh, if you are a functional tester, you would essentially have to wait for the application UI to be available to test an API that was built and the UI that was built on top of that API. But uh, if you are actually a QE, a chef left tester, you would go in and test the API as soon as the API is done, irrespective of whether the linked UI, the UI feature for that API is available uh, for testing or not. So this is shift left testing, and that's exactly what we started doing a lot in our automated test. We started distributing the overall automated test in the complete uh, uh, application layers, and at the time of implementation, we were deciding whether the test has to be implemented at the API or the lower layers of the application, or does the test need to be implemented at the UI, depending on which is available first. And in most of the cases, the APIs are available for us to be implemented the test of the API. And only those tests that are left are then implemented at the UI. So this essentially helps us uh, speed up the overall development uh, process and still remain effective in an in-sprint uh, fashion uh, <coughs> of uh, development. Uh, the, uh, the next thing that we did was divide and conquer. Imagine uh, an application which uh, uh, which has uh, which which essentially provides a way for you to log in and search some set of documents and articles and retrieve the articles in the UI. What if there are ten different kinds of articles and I want to make sure that the application is able to render. The UI uh, part of the application is able to render the uh, all the different ten variations of the articles properly. And if I have to test it uh, and I have to build an automated test around it, and if I go by the UI route uh, entirely, then I'll have to first write the code to do a login into the application, then write a code to do a perform search for to, to search for the articles from the database, and then I then go to open the article and then do the validation on the front end of the application. But the objective, so if you understand it, is just to make sure that the article is rendered properly in the article view section of the application UI. Now, the kind of the way the applications are built nowadays, these applications are essentially consuming services for each of these different steps. For login, an auth service would be used. For performing a search, a search service would be used. And for open article and retrieve an article, a data retrieval service would be used to get the data from a content, uh, uh, a content uh, host and then display it, render it properly. Now, what if uh, when I want to run this test, the auth service is now? I won't be able to execute the test because the test would halt right at the login point itself because the auth service is off. So essentially, my test is dependent on the auth service, although the intention is not to test the auth service. The intention and the objective of the test is to test the display of the article inside the application, irrespective of whether auth service is working fine or not. So what I'm trying to say is that if I go this route of UI, I have to depend on 
a uh, number of factors which are not in our control uh, when I'm trying to build it. Now, such problems are the reasons for all the flakiness in the application. They are the factors that we cannot control when we're trying to either build or automate a test. And these factors are like the responses of the services, response of the application, changes in the UI, changes in the, um, the content and the data and all of that. So how do we make sure that um, I, uh, I'm able to perform the test objectives and run a test uh, and irrespective of all these uh, dependencies and irrespective of uh, all the changes and um, ill performance of all these uh, activities. Well, we do this through mocking and stubbing out all the dependencies so that we can control them. So service virtualization, a unit test, mocking all the components that we desire, uh, that we uh, just use as dependencies, and then focusing on only that area which I'm trying to test is how we do it. So what we're trying to do is we're saying that I have one huge test, so I'm going to divide it into multiple smaller tests and then perform those smaller tests so that the overall test objective is met and the stability of all the tests can be maintained. We may have more number of tests, but overall the stability would be more and the test would be precise. And once a test fails, it would be really easy for me to trace it back and point exactly at the place which caused the problem and then fix the problem right there. So the traceability and the reporting would be proper and I have more control over the test. Let me show you an example of how this is done. In fact, I did this in the same application for which I executed a test. Uh, so if you look at the application, uh, it's a small application which allows anybody to um, do a check-in from wherever spot he is so that anybody else can look at uh, the trail of seconds and uh, in, in a condition of a danger, the trail can be used to find the person. So uh, what I did was I, I want to test that if this trail of uh, check-ins has only one item in it, how does this this particular UI appear? That does the uh, the trail looks properly or not? But because in the deployed application I already have a huge list of data against my account, I won't be able to test this particular scenario. So what I did was I mocked all the services that are being consumed by the UI. Uh, by creating my own service, uh, virtualized service on top of it, which is feeding in the data that I, exactly that data which I want for my test. So now I'm controlling the services response, I'm controlling the data that is coming in, and I'm only letting the application use that part of the application, which I need to test. So let me run the test and show you how that would happen. So when I run the test, the test is actually taking care of virtualizing the service, deploying the application in a small container, uh, which is what it is doing, um, and then uh, pointing it to the uh, to the mock that I created for the service, and then you would see this time the URL would be localhost, and port would be 9000, which is different from what it was earlier because this time it's using my deployed version of the application and uh, so I have exactly one uh, check-in there and I'm able to test a scenario where only a single check-in is available. <clears throat> so, so this is how essentially what we mean when we say divide and conquer. So divide your larger test and make them smaller and then uh, have enough stubs and mocks around so that you can control all the factors and uh, run the test properly. So where is the industry heading from here? What is the next logical step uh, that we have in front of us? Well, DevOps QA is reality. We have to uh, make sure that we are ready in terms of the space automation solution. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, provide essential support to the overall development and continuous deployment and delivery pipeline. How do we achieve it? Well, we have to uh, write smaller tests. If we are writing longer UI scenarios, we must break them into smaller tests so that they can fit properly into this uh, continuous deployment pipeline. We need to focus more on the themes. If there are multiple integration points in the application, themes are where we need to write more and more tests. And essentially, we need 
to make sure that we are using consumer driven or contract driven testing a lot more. Um, now there are multiple frameworks that are available out there with which you can do, uh, you can specifically build contract tests. So there are frameworks like PATH, which is a Ruby based framework using which you can specifically write contract tests. And then these contract tests can be used to design the both consumer as well as the uh, provider part of the application. So both ends of the contract and the theme. It's also called as theme testing. Uh, continuous deployment pipeline. So the role of test automation solution and the QE has grown from just implementing automated tests to providing necessary tools and solutions that support the implementation as well as maintenance of a continuous deployment pipeline. Uh, support the execution of tests in the pipeline as well as support the overall pipeline. Let me actually show you how I in fact have a quick demo of how this can be done. I have Jenkins in front of me and in Jenkins we can do this using build pipeline. So I'm in this particular case I'm not using, I'm using my own virtual box instance to virtualize and containerize the build. So what is happening is in the first stage the build is checked out and it is deployed into my virtual box container. Then um, all the necessary mocks are uh, uh, brought up, all the data is seeded and then tests are executed and then based on the results of the test, the build is then propagated further or if the tests have failed, uh, you would see that uh, in this case also the browser would launch because they are both UI and API tests. Uh, and uh, <coughs> So if I refresh this, the UI tests are running, the browser has launched, it's going to perform the necessary test. And so this would, uh, this is how essentially it would work. You have to complete pipeline build. And depending on how your uh, continuous deployment pipeline is, the framework essentially is already ready for it. And we have multiple other supports available, whether it is to being able to do containerization and run the automated test using framework in containers or whether linking the containerized automated test to Jira instances so that the reports and traceability can be maintained into Jira. And one interesting trend uh, that we would essentially see a lot in years to come is uh, being able to test in production. Now, with shorter periods of uh, cycles or uh, time span of doing uh, enough testing, there's a lot of tests that we won't be able to execute when the, when we have the application being built and when it is in a QA or a dev or a stage environment, pre-production. And then on top of that, there are a lot of things that go on in the production which are impossible to actually simulate in a test environment and in lab situations. For instance, the real traffic that is happening when I am performing a transaction in the application in production. The real traffic I cannot simulate in, in uh, QA or a stage environment. So there, we, we have ways in which we can run some amount of tests in production, only controlled amount of tests, but then the results of those tests can be monitored and some level of uh, data analysis can be applied to do some predictive analysis from whatever uh, that are happening in the in the field and then perform tests based on that. More like a health check that can be done in production. Now one thing that we would see in frameworks is that we would see the shift of, we've already seen the frameworks becoming more sophisticated in terms of uh, evolving from keyword driven to domain specific language driven frameworks which still are technology and uh, development factors and development framework agnostic. But then we would start seeing some frameworks which are more closer to, to some of the development technologies and frameworks like Salesforce. That's one area where uh, we are doing some research on and we we'll, might come up with uh, a new webinar on that topic for you very soon. Now to conclude this webinar session, uh, we've already seen shift left and shift right is essentially being able to test in production and do predictive analysis and monitoring in production. So we would see those trends coming in. Shift less has al always been there and it is being exercised more and more. And then shift right is somewhat 
you start seeing a lot nowadays. And then the frameworks, as you've seen, are ever evolving depending on the needs. Uh, we uh, specialize the frameworks and then we add more capabilities to it, and they are ev evolving in terms of sophistication and uh, the capabilities and practices. But we need to rethink the way we design the test cases for present day. We need to make sure the tests are smaller, um, uh, the definition are crisp and uh, clear, and then they can be implemented with most at most effectiveness. Uh, because we have technology to implement it, but then we need we need to make sure we are describing and um, authoring the test in that right approach and mindset. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you can look at uh, the QInfoTech blog, and uh, we also have various other webinars in, uh, in the series of webinars on test automation. You can look at those, the recording of those webinars, and of this webinar would also be available on our website. So uh, at this point, I'm done, and we're open for any questions that have come up. So let's look at the questions. All right, thank you, Ramandeep. I believe this was very informative and uh, must have given some food for thought to our audience. So now let's start with the Q&A phase to answer the questions received from our audience. So uh, Ramandeep, Devadeep, here's the first question. Uh, how do you handle fakey tests in CI? I, I see a lot of people asking this question a lot. How do you handle flaky tests in CI? Well, uh, black I, uh, black I have already uh, mentioned and one point in the presentation, uh, one one way to handle flakiness uh, in the test is divide and conquer. The way we are describing the test right now is uh, that we are relying on the longer scenarios that were inspected by the functional testers and the business people. But then at the time of implementation, we may uh, reason that logic that do we really have to implement the test as is as a longer scenario or can this test be broken down into smaller chunks and then those uh, smaller chunks can be implemented as individual tests and together they would form a complete test coverage. So that is one way of doing it. Uh, if you break down the test into smaller chunks and smaller tests, it's, they're easier to maintain because then you can point out exactly where the test is failing and then fix the problem right there. So essentially they are easier to maintain. And then on top of that, uh, if you have UI tests, they tend to, they are bound to be flaky because they rely on a lot of uh, internal dependencies and uh, factors that you cannot control. So it's better if you want to run UI tests, you can mock some of those dependencies out, control the environments as much as possible. Okay. Okay. So uh, next question, I see a lot of questions pouring in. Uh, so uh, using any framework for video testing, can we test a video players support different browsers and devices or not? Uh, we actually, uh, yes, yeah. so uh, I assume that you have a video player which is built using either Flash or HTML5 which you want to uh, make sure that it is uh, running properly on all different browsers, form factors, whether they are on desktop, Mac, or uh, um, a phone, uh, tablet, and mobile phones. Yes, uh, you can actually, if it's HTML5, you can actually use uh, Selenium to exercise all, or for that matter, just plain old JavaScript to exercise all of the uh, the features of the, uh, of the uh, video player. The only thing is there are a couple of things that you might not be able to test, which is the playback. I mean, you can make sure that you're able to play the video and interact with the API of the video to check the analytics of whether the video is playing, whether it is rendering properly, whether it is streaming the content uh, properly from uh, from different CDNs and all. But you won't be able to actually validate what exactly is being shown as frame by frame on the front end of the video. Uh, but then. Uh, uh, there's a lot of testing that you can actually do. In fact, for that matter, I would really like to point out that uh, uh, back in the older days, we did uh, test a video player which is called as Oyala, which is uh, one of a very popular uh, video publishing platform, um, very similar to what Brightcove is. And uh, in fact, Oyala is being used in uh, NFL uh, broadcasters as well. So uh, we did a lot of uh, testing using Selenium and JavaScript. We wrote a bunch of uh, frameworks using uh, uh, Ruby, and we wrote a whole ecosystem of uh, 
uh, virtual machines in which we had all the configurations on which we wanted to validate the compatibility of the player. And we wrote a harness on top of the player so that all the possible ways in which the player can be embedded into a web page can be simulated. And then we wrote tests using Ruby, which were launching the harness in the browser in all those VMs and then exercising the various uh, functionalities of the video player. So with the HTML5, it definitely can be tested if it's uh, flashed. Uh, it is a little difficult, but we certainly have things like Genie to test. Okay, okay, I get that. So, uh, can you also test the start speed of different network of videos? I mean, if you're testing videos, can you see test that how a video behaves on the different networks? Yeah, so uh, I think you're talking about uh, testing under adverse bandwidth conditions. Right. Yes, right. you can certainly do that. We have, uh, uh, although you'll have to take help from external uh, tools like Fiddler and other bandwidth shaper to uh, simulate those conditions properly in lab. Um, and then you can run your test on top of them and make sure that they're perfect. All right, all right. So thank you, Ramandi, for responding to the questions with such thoughtful answers. So any other conclude back? So at Qtech, from day one, we have been challenging ourselves to find better solutions for the problem, even when they do not lie in the scope and budget of a product or a project release cycle. It has always been a push to research new ideas, innovate, and solve problems of test automation. So thank you very much for joining us in this web event and spending your valuable time with us. We hope you found it useful and informative. I would also like to thank Ramandi for sharing his thoughts and putting out his experience in the field of test automation through this webinar. Please note, if there are still any questions you would like us to discuss, please feel free to write back to us and we'll get back to you at the earliest. You will also soon receive a short survey about today's web event. We would like really appreciate if you could just spend a couple of minutes to provide your valuable feedback. Thank you again. You may log off and have a nice day.